so I was previously the general secretary of the student association and now I'm on our academic board um, and I'm the representative for law like student member I'll kind of just start off with what an SPA is a student partnership agreement and I'll refer to it um, as an SPA and why you might need one and in terms of if it's right in the context of your university and I'll go through just how you know how it was implemented at UTS and some of the challenges that we faced um, and then as I mentioned at the beginning of the zoom uh, it's been a year since we've officially signed the SPA so kind of what the results are a year later and um, the outcomes we've received from that and kind of how you how you can get successful um, outcomes in terms of you know accountability implementation things like that um, and then uh, if we have the time just end off with some practical takeaways and actually beginning the process um, and also just broader discussion um, I'll kind of get into it with the very beginning um, straightforward explanation of kind of what a student partnership agreement is for those who also might not be familiar so basically a student partnership agreement is a quite a formal agreement that is negotiated between students and um, the educational institution that you're at so it might be multiple student groups who come together um, and they have some priorities that they would like the university to address um, and so what this agreement does is codify all the roles of either the different student groups involved. Um, so, for example, uh, we've got the Student Association, which plays a big role on my campus. We have our um, student leaders, which are the students that are on our academic boards, um, our faculty board, things like that. And the third group we had involved uh, is something called Activate UTS. They run all the social clubs and societies on campus. They're more the like social hub of the uni. So those three student groups or which ones are relevant to your campus will come together, um, outline priorities, um, kind of their rights, their responsibilities, their role within the university, um, and then kind of put them in a formal agreement with the university where it's signed on as kind of codifying what each group's priorities and roles are for the rest of the year and a kind of a commitment um, on the part of the uni to not only work towards what priorities are in the agreement, but also meaningfully engage with students as partners in broader decision makers, um, as broader decision makers in the university. So that is a very high level explanation, but we'll break it down a bit. Um, and so right now in Australia, four universities, um, when I last uh, checked, had negotiated SPAs. Um, and so, but our one in New South Wales, I think, was the first um, to kind of get that up and running. But all SPAs look a bit different. This is kind of just what we've experienced at UTS and how I've run it. Um, so really quickly, this, I will show you the student partnership agreement itself. I'll take you to a link, but I don't want you to be faced with all, it's a, it's a bit of a formal looking document um, with all the writing. But at the beginning of the student partnership agreement, we have um, the purpose. So here are specific to UTS. We've discussed how um, we, as a university, we were moving into our 2027 strategy, which is basically a strategy that the uni wrote by themselves. Um, it really didn't have any consultation with students. It was called the 2027 plan. As you can imagine, there was a very much corporate side to it. Um, not a lot of engagement with students. It just talks about those things like, you know, lifetime learners. We want to be an innovative uni, but we as students kind of saw a gap that, well, where's the strategy from the student perspective? So the SPA was kind of able to fill that gap. Um, and as you can see here, we connected it to that strategy and its vision and values, um, but gave our student voice. Um, so it, the, as you can see, the agreement uh, seeks to engage the student community um, and deliver on those mutual obligations, which are those priorities I will talk about. Um, and I think one of the most important points for me um, when we were right drafting the purpose was recognizing the role that student representatives play and the importance of seeing students as genuine partners and so a lot of what you'll see in SPAs um, uh, they can be like this this sentence really could be put in a document and you know forgotten about for the next however many years but I think having it there in writing and what we did as students is we really capitalized on all this being codified um, and that fed into a lot of the work we do saying you know how can you you know not um, you know do this priority or this initiative we have or uh, why haven't you consulted us that you're cutting the course of psychology like we have committed to and agreed in writing um, that you know we're recognized as roles um, as uh, people who, like the, we're the students we have a big role in the campus um, so I think having that in the agreement was actually really really valuable um, even sometimes more than the priorities themselves, it's um, 
having it there um, in writing as a reference point for any future um, student leadership initiatives, et cetera, um, and just shaping the culture of student leadership at UTS. Um, so it's going backwards. So if I move to the next one, really quickly, just so um, you kind of get an understanding of why, why an SPA, um, I've kind of tried to put down what the goals are. They're all very interconnected, but I'll go through them here. And again, please, um, if you have any questions, put your hand up, ask me questions, um, and I'm more than happy to stop and give a bit of an explainer. Uh, so in the short term, um, what an SPA can do is it can just first off make students feel like they have a platform to engage. Um, right. As students who started the SPA, we, you know, paved that way. But from the SPA onwards, there's a very clear platform for representation. Um, and I think I find with a lot of students when they make contributions or they want to, you know, bring up something with the, you know, uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor of Education, which is our main kind of contact point, or any of their deans, any of their faculty reps, um, it's kind of like, where do I begin? And so what the SPA did is it, ha because of there's such broad priorities in there, it acts as a launching point for students to bring those ideas forward. Um, and uh, within it, uh, you'll, which you'll see later, is there's formalised agreed priorities for two years. So there is a strong commitment to agreeing on those things. And um, I've talked about these priorities a lot, which you'll see, but they're things like um, implementing a sexual assault and harassment survey. Um, uh, sorry, not survey. There was a NSS survey and implementing a response to that. Um, so then we, um, jumping ahead of myself, but from putting in the SPA, we actually wrote a UTS um, sexual assault and harassment SASH policy, and that is now codified within UTS governance. Um, we put things in there like recognising the right for the student association to run campaigns and protests on campus, because we had issues in the past where our demonstrations weren't, um, were uh, kind of interrupted. Um, for lack of a better word, um, and things like that. We also talked about sustainability on campus and the university working towards um, climate goals, things like that, um, just so you guys have a better understanding of what it actually means when we talk about mutual priorities. Um, it also codifies our roles um, and it really just puts in writing that, you know, we are the student union, this is our role, um, this is what we're here for, uh, et cetera. And the last one is that staff are able to seek direct advice from student leaders on specific areas and it sets up those networks. So now, and this this SPA was distributed to all staff and all faculties. So what it did, especially when there's the actual students whose roles um, were there at the time of um, it's the SPA's inception, is that staff actually reach out to those students because um, it really does depend on the staff member. But to be honest, the deans of your faculties, they want student input for certain things. They want engagement with students. Um, they don't want to be teaching to an unpassionate like cohort. They want that engagement sometimes. And it um, meant that not only did they seek direct advice, but they were kind of encouraged to. And if they didn't, um, then it would be like a well, why didn't you? We've got all these networks set up. We have this entire process set up for you to engage with students uh, and you chose not to kind of thing. And that's a bit um, harsh, but that's sometimes how it needs to be put. Um, and long term goals, obviously, a culture shift towards student participation and roles in like decision making within the university. Um, and uh, like now, it allows us to engage with external organisations to um, kind of knowledge share, pass on this information to other um, people like yourself so we can figure out, well, what's actually possible uh, and what's um, feasible when we're talking about student leadership. Um, and it's always nice to have a bit of a precedent. I'll just quickly talk about the like our journey in the context of why um, the student leaders on my campus kind of came together and found now a really good time to implement the SPA. Um, so I briefly mentioned how the UTS 2027 strategy was created, um, but it didn't include any student input um, or kind of, uh, there was nothing that students had specifically worked on or even asked for. It was based off a lot of secondary data, like student surveys, um, which makes sense, but I think there's nothing that can replace talking to actual students and consulting with students. Um, but just, uh, briefly, so the when the pandemic began, student leaders were called on to advise um, about like remote learning, and I'm sure everyone at the university has experienced that original rush of you know are we going online? What's happening? Um, and so the academic board student member for law, which was the predecessor before me, um, developed a student leadership plan to increase um, participation and support for student leaders. 
Um, and so this wasn't, this was separate to the SPA. This was their own kind of idea because again, we were still kind of in the pandemic at that stage, but there was a, very much a lack of student engagement. Um, and a lot of our academic boards, our faculty boards um, acted kind of as a rub, rubber stamp. And there wasn't that students didn't feel empowered to kind of uh, bring up the things they wanted or ask the hard questions at times. Um, and then in 2021, with this, from this um, student engagement, uh, we uh, introduced a Indigenous student representative to our academic board, which was a really big feat. It unfortunately shouldn't have to have been as difficult as it was, but for us it was a massive milestone because um, our university, and I would love to hear if, um, what you guys might be like, um, but we'll get into that a bit later, our university had something against kind of changing governance rules. Um, so obviously like changing the bylaws of the university or the rules of the board isn't an easy thing to do um, but it was almost an excuse from the university to not make these changes because you know if we put an indigenous member that's going to change the amount of votes on the board and that's going to um you know mean there's one more student rep which um uh, if there's an extra student rep that's an extra vote for students should we add one for staff like things like that um but it was almost like at that stage how could they say no. So we continued the work and um, that was something uh, we achieved. And then from that, um, the planning for the student partnership agreement began because that's when um, the 2027 strategy really came out. Um, and uh, from this, we act, we were lucky kind of enough to have the um, deputy vice chancellor at, at the time be quite supportive of the program. And I think that's something I'll go into a bit later. Um, how can you kind of Go about this when you need you need a key decision maker within the university who is um willing to be on the other side of those negotiations we can't negotiate within ourselves and then have no one to bring it to um so um from there we began discussion about the spa we conceptualized what would we want it to look like and then the um, national student safety survey results came out the um ncss survey which was uh, all about uh, sash on campus and for uts um, produce some not great results. Um, and so that also led us to kind of figure out our priorities as a student leadership cohort and implementing um, those into the SPA. Um, and then we ran our anti-racism campaign, it all kind of worked towards um, the final agreement. So now I've put a uh, QR code on the screen. You can scan it with your phones potentially, or you can just Google UTS SPA or Student Partnership Agreement. Um, and kind of take a look. It's a, I might actually share on my screen too now that I think about it. So this is what the agreement looks like. Um, so if I do a quick scroll, as you can see, it's a bit of a formal looking document. Um, it's got all our collaborative priorities and it's signed by um, the Deputy Vice Chancellor at the time. Um, and like Dad talk, I talked about, um, this was the president of the Activate Board, which ran our socials, um, like social clubs and societies. Um, the a counselor on the UTS Students Association um, on behalf of the SA, and then um, the student member for Academic Board, who was the member before me, um, who I worked very closely on this with, and that um, brought in the three student groups with the uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor. And so I'm not going to um, go through this in uh, length, but um, we, when when you look at the structure, and obviously if you are looking to implement SPA your own universities, you know, feel free to um, look at how this is done. We obviously introduced it, looked at the purpose, which I showed you guys. We talked about inclusive governance, um, and this really, this part we wanted to put in because of, um, because of uh, us being omitted from the 2027 strategy for UTS, where we, you know, kind of put together that it's about students and staff working together. That's the only way university succeeds um, as an institution. Um, and, and what, you know, it depends on mutual respect, integrity, meaningful interaction. Um, and so we also here set out what rep student representation at UTS currently looks like, um, just kind of as a point of reference. Um, and then roles and responsibilities, um, which is, again, obviously these agreements students tend to get more out of in terms of wanting engagement. Um, so, you know, it's always good to put in there what our roles and responsibilities as student leaders are, um, which is very just, you know, making sure that we're providing reliable representation for the student voice um, and doing our best. Um, and so the main part is the collaborative priorities. And so this is all the mutually agreed obligations um, and things 
that we as the student body wanted to work towards and we split it up into different projects um the responsibility um so it's like you know creating that accountability um which is really important is you know you can put as much down as you want in writing but unless you create accountability and then follow up on it um not much can really happen the outcomes and the why um, so we split our collaborative priorities into four sections. Um, the first one is about student participation and engagement and leadership. Um, the second one was about uh, inclusion. Uh, so this um, can be everything from accessibility um, to uh, the LGBT community, to uh, our anti-racism campaigns, um, to also uh, a lot of our NSS stuff came off the back of um, this and so as you can see the biggest part of the student agreement was the results from the survey um, and so I don't want to dive too too deep but things like this so considering an introduction of a single point of contact for the handling of the complaint of sexual harassment um, this was a really important point because what would happen at UTS with the complaints is that you say something happened at a society event that was run by Activate. You'd have to complain to Activate. You'd have to put your own um, uh, uh, form in with UTS counselling. You'd have to put one into the actual um, UTS governance body. So what would happen is that process of uh, re-traumatisation. So what we wanted to do is a single point of contact that a student could go to, feel comfortable with, and they could handle a lot of the um, other uh, contact, things like that. Um, were really important and it's something we achieved at the university there were some outcomes and um that's currently being worked on um so the third one is sustainability um and the fourth one is about quality management which is um obviously with online learning uh student um student the, the quality of teaching sometimes can go very uh, downhill especially as you as uts were um, make, putting a lot of staff on casual contracts. So, you know, staff can't, sometimes can't put in those hours and uh, it just became a um, situation where the Student Association uh, was running demonstrations and about, um, you know, staff, you know, staff can work in conditions of student learning conditions, that kind of um, uh, situation. And, oh, well, there's one on communication, which is just about communication between um, students and staff. Uh, so, yeah, if I head back to the presentation, I know that was a very um, big crash course, but just so you have an understanding of what the agreement actually is in terms of its content. Um, so I do here have a bit of a timeline, but I'm not going to go through that because I think I might be able to share these slides um, with you after and you guys can have a read of that. But it's just it was very practical and, you know, how we um, went about uh, implementing the SBA. Um, and so this part, um, I think, will is quite important um, because I sit here a year later talking about the SBA. I'm um, in a very, you know, great um, Wayne has done a lot of really good things for students, but I can't underestimate that there were quite a lot of barriers and challenges, which is why I think there are such few SPAs because it is such a big project to undertake, um, especially when, you know, we all, I'm sure, believe in student advocacy and student activists and, um, you know, representing the student body, but for a lot of us, it isn't a full-time job. And especially in your, if you're in a position like a student's association or academic board role, um, the terms are one year. So by the time you start these projects, you know, you and you get your head around the role, you're already um, looking towards the next year. And I think sometimes this is what university leadership may rely on because, you know, every student goes to that phase of getting to it, figuring out what they want to do. By the time you figure it out, um, you know, you're heading towards the end of the year um, and considering exams and everything for students. So um, in terms of challenges, so the negotiation process, I would say, is quite a um a challenge because there is such a power imbalance between the students who are bringing the uh, agreement to be signed um, and actual the university leadership. So 
I would suggest unless you believe in what you're putting in the SPA and you can negotiate something that you think is quite, um, you know, you're proud of to have in there as students, um, try not to settle because we put a lot of really strong language, especially as a student union, um, about um, improving staff conditions, about not cutting our student magazine. But we found that um, the university's tendency when they were sending us their drafts back was to water down the language, um, you know, develop a plan or um, or consider. And whereas us students wanted, you know, much more visa um, language. So I think we found we got to a place where we were at a very um, happy point, but it did take a lot of back and forth. And it very and if you are so set on putting the SBA, rushing that process, being like, all right, well, at least they're doing it, um, can really leave you with a final product that. Um, is not as powerful and also prioritizing the issues so what we did is each of those three bodies i've talked about the um, student association activate um, and the leaders on academic board each was set with three key priorities or initiatives flesh those out and then include those but the thing is is that students especially at this time of um you know the cost of living crisis how universities you know occasionally being run a bit more like businesses than um you know institutions of academia are potentially you know there's there's an endless list of things that need to be included and worked on and prioritizing what issues you want to include um is always such a key challenge because you know certain issues affect other student groups and it's like how do you decide what we as a student association, for example, prioritise as our three key issues. Um, that is very hard and you don't want to leave people out and you don't want to leave issues out. Um, but at the end of the day, you have to be able to make those decisions. So thinking about those very early on um, is always a good idea. Um, another uh, challenge is the uncertainty of kind of the future from the student perspective and the university leadership perspective. For students, um, you, we're relying on every student that comes into the role um, is going to consistently work towards the outcomes of the SPA. So if you have, you know, for even three years of no student leadership or participation, the SPA can easily be a forgotten document. It requires on passionate, ambitious student leaders who want to continue the work and see the longevity of these initiatives, especially because, like I said, even though the SPA is implemented, working on the initiatives within the SPA Need, needs continuous work um, and it's also reviewed biannually so we get to update our um, what we want the priorities to be um, which is, I think is a really good way to keep it current to whatever current issues students are facing but it requires the work of student leaders to update those priorities and to have those discussions um, and also another thing is that you need a good working relationship with the key administrative decision maker to begin the SPA and to see its continuation because it needs to be re-signed every two years. Um, so I think that point kind of speaks for itself. If you have university leadership that isn't willing to commit to students, engage with students and empower them, then you can't really um, continue um, such an important initiative. Um, and the last one is varying range of students perspective, of student perspectives. Um, so like I said, in terms of managing what language you'll put in the put in the agreement and, you know, how, uh, what issues we thought were priority or how far we think we could have taken those issues. All students from all different groups have different expectations of what an SP is going to look like. And depending on whether you operate within an academic board or within a student association, um, I think you understand that, yeah, different students have different ideas of what a good SPA is and how strong it needs to be. Um, and linking to that is m maintaining an activist union because at the end of the day, student associations are activist bodies. They are um, not only service providers, but, you know, campaigning bodies and you have to provide a um, balance of the both. And so making sure that, you know, this SPA, for a better word, doesn't make you lie down and roll over because, look, guys, we've achieved student inclusion, like it's all there in writing. Um, you still need to be able to hold the university leadership accountable to these outcomes and to the SPA and to um, whatever else you would like. Because one concern we had from students at the SPA is, well, if we've agreed with management that these are our roles and responsibilities and this is what we're doing, what if um, there's something in there or something in the 2027 strategy, for example, that we don't agree with and we want to you know, protest against or run a demonstration or run a campaign against university? Will that you know, kind of create censorship. Um, 
And I will say the SPA definitely doesn't, especially because we very much closely looked at the wording of the agreement and made sure there was nothing binding um, in that sense. Um, so there were concerns and criticisms in that way, but it's just about, um, and some of those are very valid, and it's just about mitigating and working towards, um, like, solving those um, issues, but also making sure you have a very strong understanding of what is in the SPA um, to address those concerns. The next slide is a quick I discussion. think the best advice, um, but I can give or I'm looking at those challenges currently trying to face. implement, I try to make it is as creating very strong messaging around but within the SPA your university and creating very strong exposure, exposure to it. What do you think um, which some of the barriers uh, that you I'll discuss a bit further, um, but potentially face? The SPA, and maybe if we have time, if it remains at some ways, we can mitigate discussions, um, and it is something that students refer to consistently, be proud of. It rather than becoming something that people have to drag out, it becomes just a constant talking point. And so that even if the students are super engaged and they know everything about the SPA, or they are very like, they have a leadership role, they come to one meeting every six months, they still will know what the SPA is and they're still able to refer to it and um, at least be aware of those, um, the priorities, so they're able to um, work towards it. And That was also like in all honesty done with me because i worked on it with the previous law academic board member and as a law student as a student um, was involved i was obviously considering the role and i love the space so that's why we were able to communicate and work so closely knowing that um i could continue the work um, and i think something also is really important as to what you're saying is a really strong handover um always so even if that person might not have been involved something we actually put in the SPA, sorry, is um, uh, just quickly referred to is about um, like about training and creating a comprehensive handover package to support student leaders in their role um, and give them those key contacts rather than making students work from scratch. Uh, and so, yeah, definitely something I think a lot of universities and students face um, and just kind of has to be made aware of. Wonderful. So I realised I'm very bad at planning timing, but I will kind of try and end off because um, I'm sure if things get to end off with where we are one year later. Um, and I've touched on it here and there. So if uh, these in short, um, we've made progress on a lot of the outcomes of the SPA. And I don't say it lightly that, you know, just because they were in there, we worked on them. We had different student um, so many different students working on different aspects. So our women's officer was working on the NSS survey um, and SSS survey um, results and outcomes. Our welfare officer um, worked on certain certain um, sustainability goals. As a law academic board member, I worked on kind of the student leadership engagement, um, things like that. Um, across university, we were able to touch or at least at least begin discussions and um, make sure that kind of university leadership knows we're not letting these things slide. We are. We are continually, you know, working, we're engaged um, in terms of just because they're, you know, put down, um, this is where the kind of the real work begins. As I know that sounds like a lot of burden on the students, but I, when I say I really mean in the context of our meetings, you know, we, we always, something we always wanted was no exams that are worth more than 60% because 60% exams um, is inequitable for some students because, you know, you get to the end of the semester and you may pass or fail based on one exam. Um, so things like that, we include in the SPA and we'll just make sure to bring up at the meeting. We'll write a paper on it. And we say you committed to this in the SPA um, to work on, you know, equitable assessments for students. And where we're working off that and this is what we're bringing to you, um, things like that. It's become a running agenda point in our student council liaison group. So um, this is another little committee. They love their committees. But um, so with so the UTS council, which um, is kind of the highest governing body, uh, had one ex officio member from council chairs kind of a student group and the students communicate to that council member, they bring it to council. So it's actually a running agenda point. Where are we with the SPA outcomes? So it gives students the opportunity to make those contributions, which is wonderful. Um, like I've been talking about, it's referenced a lot. Um, we, we make it part of the, the lexicon of student leadership is, you know, the SPA. Um, and then a big one I'm going to, um, I really want to just 
as the final touch on talk about, is our student advisory board that was created as a byproduct of the SPA, um, which I'll get to. Um, and then obviously it's a really good accountabil accountability mechanism um, for the things that we work towards. Um, so I had a quote from our chair of academic board I got for this presentation because in a reversal of roles, we need the staff opinion here just to make sure, you know, as a student, I'm not, um, you know, this and that. But I think they kind of agree in terms of, you know, it helps break down those barriers. It allows us to jointly concentrate on the issues um, that are really key to the universities and also defines these relationships. Um, so these are just some, these are the priorities we had, but I'll um, move past them, but you can read them in the SPA and we've done different work on all um, different sections. Um, and so the student advisory board, uh, which is the final thing I want to talk about, which is a very, very new development as of um, a month or two ago. And so what happened is this is our new current deputy vice chancellor. Her name is Kylie. Um, and to be honest, she's one of, I, I think we're very fortunate at UTS that she is our point person because compared to some other staff members who may have at UTS, um, she is really uh, committed to engaging with students. She has children of her own that are at other universities. Um, I think one in Queensland actually. Um, so I think she understands students a bit more than previous people have held the role. Um, and so the different presidents of the organizations um, are acting as an advisory um, board. And like, what does that mean? Um, essentially I've, Put here, it's not a board in the normal sense of you know our faculty boards, academic boards. What it literally is is when there is um, a new student uh, initiative being rolled out, um, and we have running ones at UTS. So we have a lot coming up about you know like orientation week. Um, what are we doing about the student uh, the student experience? How are we addressing Chat GPT? Before any of those papers are brought to academic board, Kylie has to consult the the student group. Um, and um, they're all very uh, uh, capable student leaders who, you know, president of the association. They're all um, really good, at, I think, actually not acting as like, because there's no voting, it's it's a board to discuss. Um, and so you can see that the, you know, the association president has brought in the rising cost of living and how they can support the wider community. Um, we talk, and it's mentioned here that it, it was as a product of the student partnership agreement and it's um, driving towards those, um, priorities we've uh, agreed on um, and builds upon those commitments set out. And so Kylie wrote this, or the uni wrote, released this media release themselves. Um, and, you know, just acknowledging that, you know, the group, like we're building upon these commitments. Like it's a very strong, like in my perspective from where we work a couple of years ago where the university didn't really care or do much. The fact that they're acknowledging that we have commitments and we're working towards them um, is a step in the right direction. Um, and our social, so activates like our social clubs, you know, what, what the student experience looks like outside of um, the classroom and the group meets and they report back to the student body on updates. Um, and so, yeah, so this basically came across as almost a very unexpected product, um, but something that's been really, really fantastic. And you can see the outcomes and you can see academic board when every time Kylie gets up to speak, um, she'll, you know, um, refer to one of her um, the people she's talked about on the student board and they're actually able to bring that um, really, really important student perspective. Um, so, yeah, I might leave it at that. I got a quote from her um, about, you know, genuine student partnerships, accelerate our experience um, and engaging with students. Um, but, I, I, yeah, I think that's it where we can leave it at. I have a discussion question. Um, and I did, I will share these slides, sorry, I'm flicking through about a practical roadmap of a very, a very short version of how you can 
um, begin the process of implementing one at your university. That was kind of our journey at UTS from its context, conception, um, how we worked towards it, the challenges we faced, and really um, where we are a year later, which there are some very outcomes we expected and we worked towards and wanted, but some um, unintended consequences that have been um, uh, quite pleasant. So yeah, thank you all so much for listening to me speak for an hour. Uh, if you have any questions or if Anna wants to pass it over, please, please let me know.